Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 65 of the Showbound Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Raskin, here as always with Ethan Cardwell. Cards, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, not too bad. Um, just chilling another day, family day. So happy family day to everybody um, when you hear this two days late, I guess. But uh, no, I know, <laughs> I know you had an exciting weekend, so let me hear about it a little bit. Yeah, so... Uh, we had the, the rock hockey team. We went up to Lakehead and Thunder Bay to play two games this weekend. And uh, we, we ended up losing both. The whole thing was a mess from the start. Like our first flight got canceled on the Friday night because of the weather. And all of a sudden we're flying in on the morning of the game and 2 30 AM wake up to head to the airport. And um, it was a nightmare. Like the whole, every, <laughs> we were all so tired. Like it's tough. And uh, one of the things I noticed, which is so funny, like, so you know how guys are on the bus on the way to the game on the way back. Like when you're on the bus, it's, it is, it's fun, but the guys are like that in the airport in public. <laughs> and, you know, we have guys screaming, um, like swearing at each other, like being loud people like in the airport and stuff and like chirping security guards with their masks and things. It was like, I, you can't take a group of guys like that out in public. It was so funny. So that was the first funny thing. And um, I had to even write a couple things down. Cause like, some of these were so funny. I remember on the plane. Um, so there was like 50 people on the plane. We were 30 of them. So there was like 20 just public regular people. And our guys are just screaming F-bombs at each other up and down the aisles, uh, you know, talking about talking about girls and whatever, like loudly, like, you know, yelling across the plane for everyone to hear. It was, just, it was really yeah. fun. Um, and uh, one of them, like Rochi, Jacob Rochi, who's a friend of yours and on our team, who we talk about a couple of times on the podcast, like, one of the guys on the team is being loud and Rochi tells him like, can you quiet down? And the guy just turns around and he's like, what? Like he just screams to him and everyone's looking on the plane. And this guy's just screaming and he's got his feet up in the air. Like, um, <laughs> it's like, you know, what I mean? these guys are just a bit ridiculous, but it was, it was pretty funny, the, the flights. And so I guess Lakehead, I, I had never been there, but um, there is, there is a junior hockey team in Lakehead in the SIJHL or in Thunder Bay. I mean, the Thunder Bay North Stars, but there's no, there's really nothing else much to do there. So the university team's like the big deal. So we get in and they hadn't had a game there in two months because of COVID and they weren't allowed fans or a lot of fans until this, this game. So I guess our cab driver's like, Oh my God, like you guys are the Brock team. Like everyone's been talking about this game because there's been nothing to do. And like, everyone just wants to go out. So all of a sudden I realized there's like a lot of hype around this and we get to the rink and there's a couple thousand fans there early. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was a cool environment to play a couple fights. I think I, did I send you the, video, the, one, the one scrap? No, no. Oh, man, there was such a good tilt in the game. But so the, it, it was like, you know, it got rowdy game one and we lost. And then game two gets even rowdier. Like it, it, things got out of hand on the ice and all of a sudden things get out of hand off the ice. And I told you a bit about this on the phone, but uh, for the listeners, like there's security outside our dressing room and stuff. But like I said, the game was getting out of hand. So the fans were getting out of hand and, all of a sudden there's like 30 or 40 fans just like that rushed our dressing room in the intermission. Well, it started the first intermission. No one, the fans were, were fine. Like they were chirping our guys coming off and, and what she says goes back at one of the fans, like the fans giving it to Rochi stop there, like laughing at him and the fan keeps chirping. And then whatever, like the fans chirping about Brock and Rochi's just like, you're an idiot. Like you're the one who you paid to see me play. Like That's what Rochi says to the guy. And then just walks off. Like <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> Um, but then so second intermission, you know, things get out of hand and that's the second period. And all of a sudden they're down outside the dressing room, like as our guys are coming off the ice and there's three security guards outside of dressing. Not, no one's doing a thing. And they're just Thunder Bay locals. Like they didn't care. They're laughing at the chirps at our guys. So our guys can't get in the room. Like I thought it was going to be a brawl. Like people were really heated. It was getting intense. Um, people were like having to hold each other back and stuff. Like I'd never seen anything like it. Um, I, I actually was, was shocked. And then our, our head coach, is yelling at the security guard, right? Like, can you like do something about this? Like get these fans out of here. And the security guard starts yelling back at our coach. He's, you know, telling him to like, shut the F up and stuff. And then our coach is like going getting into it with the security who's not doing their job. Like the, it, it got really out of hand. And then the refs just come out of their room and they're watching it. And I see a couple of Lakehead guys down the hall, just laughing at us. Right. So, you know what, in, in a game like that, the fans made a difference because all of a sudden we're taking penalties in the third. Our guys are angry. Um, so it was, it, it, it caught a little out of hand at the end of the day. Like it was pretty funny and there was no harm done, but uh, you know, it, things could have caught ugly there. There was about 40 of them at the room. So I thought it was going to be like, everyone kind of grab a guy one-on-one sort of um, <laughs> get, get going. And, um, yeah. So anyway, it, it, it was, you know, we didn't get the points or anything we wanted out of the game. And 
um, it, it was a fun trip though. And, but just the guys, you know, sometimes people got a little bit out of hand and yeah, Rochi was saying how going out in that third period after he was like getting into it with the fans, he had scored in the second period. He was like, um, if he scores that period, he was going to go and like shush the crowd and stuff. And unfortunately he didn't, but it would have been sick. Um, yeah. So it was, it was a cool environment to play in, man. And, uh, it, it was a really fun trip with, with all that stuff. So anyway, um, that was the weekend and, uh, you know, we got two more games this week coming up, so we're, we're excited. So how, how about you? The Colts are rolling again. So that's good. Yeah. You know, the, we went seven in a row without getting a win. So that's always obviously tough and, you know, morale can get down and stuff. And I think that was the best, best part of it all kind of guys just kept positive and now turned it into a nice little three game win streak. And uh, with the day to day on family day, we play in about two and a half hours, three hours, obviously myself not included in the lineup tonight, but uh, no, just, I'm looking forward to getting back, man. Like I'm only, I'm less than two weeks now. So I'm just kind of chomping at the bitch, practicing hard, working out hard, trying to stay in the best shape I can for when I'm back. So it's been good. Like, you know, same old, same old, just going to the, going to the gym every day with the trainer and then kind of doing my own bag ski. You're on a little bit of a different schedule than the rest of the team. So it's hard in that sense, but just staying focused. And now that it's kind of the home stretch of the suspension here, I'm, I'm just looking forward to getting back and, it's nice to be around the guys too, cheering them on. It, it keeps me involved and it keeps me uh, in the game. So I'm just super excited for, for these next two weeks to kind of fly by and then, then get back to it. But yeah, no, the team, uh, the team's figuring it out and the young guys looking, looking good right now. So it's all positives and Barry. Yeah. And, and you know what I was saying to the scratches this week who are up, up in the press box there with me in Lakehead when, uh, when you watch a game from up top in the rink, you learn a lot more than, than when you're like on the bench and stuff, you, you can see the plays so well. And it's like when you watch it in video, how you watch a video and it, it all seems so obvious from there. So, you know, have you been watching from like up top and, and learning stuff like that, seeing the game? Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, when you're older in the league, you kind of think you have it all figured out. And then say you go on a little dry spell, you're wondering like, why, why what's going on? Like I'm, I'm older, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm better. Like you think all those things, but you really just have to watch the game. Like quite frankly, there's not too much physicality in the league. And if you can hold the puck all day, if you want, like the longer you hold the puck, the more opportunity you're going to have to make plays. Cause really nobody's kind of collapsing on you when you have the puck, there's, there's so much more time and space than you think you have. So I think that's the key that a lot of people kind of gather from watching from above, especially at the OHL level, that you have way more time than you think out there. Yeah, like watching from up top too, you you can see plays developing that you can't see when you're actually on the ice. So that's why like you hear fans yelling things and they think they know it all. And maybe they do, but you know, you learn like our scratches and you know, I make sure they're paying attention to the game because you learn a lot. So it's a good lesson too for the people who are being scratched in wherever their junior leagues are or something, you know, like watch the game and you you learn a lot about what what plays to make and, and stuff like that. But uh, I, I just was going through my notes here before we move on and talk about our guest. There was one more story from the weekend I wanted to share. So going back about um, how the guys are the same on the bus as they are everywhere. We're, we're in the breakfast room in the hotel, which um, we our, our lunch and dinners were private, but the breakfast was just like the hotel breakfast. Everybody, you know, in the hotel can come. So it, yeah. it's like, like our team's there for team breakfast, but there's also other uh, people staying in the hotel there. So our guys are sitting there like at the buffet and stuff. And one guy just lets out this massive fart. Right. And everyone's, everyone's laughing, whatever. And then the next guy goes and lets out a bigger one. And everyone's now just having a fart contest in the breakfast room with all these strangers. Oh and my God. I'm just like, you can't take these guys anywhere. <laughs> hey, the, the one guy lets a big one rip. And then he's like, asking the trainer if he has any baby powder and stuff. <laughs> and there's just like so many strangers in this room. and <laughs> They're just eating their breakfast, man. <laughs> oh my god man so by the sounds of it you only recruit clowns and your team just a bunch of meatheads <laughs> it was so funny like these guys because this is our only road trip of the year other than you know what who knows what's gonna happen in playoffs where we have to go but at least for the regular season now um with the covid season we're not doing a lot of traveling so this is our only so the guys were just excited to get out and be in a hotel and so just like you guys were when you did that northern trip a couple weeks ago and, um but yeah it, they were a little bit overexcited i'd say um, now I, I want to mention our guest this week. We got Mikel Agard, who just came back from the Olympics where he played from for Denmark. Um, 
former captain of Team Denmark for the World Juniors, played in a couple World Juniors, played in a couple World Championships, and now the Olympics. And he also played in the AHL, ECHL, OHL, U Sports, and in three different pro leagues in Europe. And now he's playing uh, in the Allsvenskan for Moto, one of the most storied Swedish organizations. So it's an awesome interview, and we'll get that to you guys shortly. But I do want to talk a bit about the Olympics as well. Um, Team Canada women's team won gold. And uh, last podcast, we had talked about how uh, we were all going to watch that game. And uh, it was exciting. And I actually, I did get to watch it because I was working late. And by the time I got to bed, it was like 1.15 and the third period was on. So I, I ended up watching just the third, which is the most exciting part. So Canada won gold. And um, we're looking to get some members of the team there on the podcast in the coming weeks. So that's something to look forward to. But yeah, um, what do you think of that in the in the game, the women's game? Yeah, obviously it's huge. I know um, in the last kind of maybe 10 years, the women's hockey game has grown. Um, there's been more opportunities to be on broadcasts and stuff like that and just kind of grow the game for young girls around Canada. And, you know, we kind of saw it when the women's soccer team in Canada oh, with, yeah. with what they did was incredible. So to be able to kind of follow it up at this Olympics with the hockey team, it's amazing for women's sport in Canada, just inspiring young ladies to be able to kind of pursue their dreams and kind of see what's available for them as, as an option for, for a career. And just to be able to understand how important it is to have a team like that and have the whole country backing you. I thought it was very special and uh, definitely a moment that uh, hockey Canada won't forget um, with all the struggles to kind of get to this Olympics and it'll be, it'll be a special one for, for them to have this Olympic goal. Yeah. It, it was, it was awesome and good for Canada and good for USA, obviously coming really close down to the wire there. And now I want to pose a question um, to you and to the listeners as well. And I don't know, I wrote this down. I don't know if it's a good one or not, but my question is why can't there be hitting in women's hockey? And now I'll support it by just saying at any level, men's or women's, you know, like watching hockey with hitting is more exciting than without. And if we want to, grow the women's game how everyone is always saying why shouldn't hitting be allowed because like it just makes the game more exciting to be honest in my opinion and I think a lot of people would agree um so do you think that that would make sense yeah I feel like especially at the Olympic level there is already some rubbing out there there's some hits for sure um on the big ice surface too there's not as much as there would be in in their women's pro league. So it'd be interesting if the IIHF did come out or, or the women pro leagues did come out and say that they would in state hitting. I feel like it's something that would take, take some time. Um, it's something that would have to develop over years because so many girls grow up and never hit in their lives. And yeah. I, I feel like it would be weird to kind of just throw it at them and say, okay, you can now run around and try to kill each other. But uh, <laughs> No, I, I don't know. It's it, That's an interesting one and one I don't have an answer to. Yeah. Uh, just a general question to, to discuss amongst yourselves. And, so, and yeah, it would have to be introduced to the minor hockey level and teach hitting, but because it's the same thing, like when you watch men's hockey, like the, the year, I think you can't hit now until what, like 13 or is it even like 16? Now, when when can you start hitting now? They change the yeah, rules. Yeah, I, I want to say it's like 14. It's, it's a while. So like if you watch a 13-year-old men's team playing a 14-year-old with hitting, like the difference in entertainment is way more when there's hitting. And I think, um, I, and, and it, also the same question, kind of like, why can't women's hockey wear visors, you know, like, well, I mean, I feel like, um, I mean, people don't like, I don't care if I get a cut, but I feel like the women are better looking than we are. So <laughs> I, I agree with that. But I, I mean, at least maybe they could have the option. Like it, it's allowed, but they don't have to. Oh um, yeah. That would actually be pretty cool. It just like hockey looks cooler with a visor on. I'm not gonna lie. Like it just, you know, it just does. Yeah. And then, but the, then you have college too. I don't know. It's weird. Like, why doesn't NCAA wear visors too? A lot of it is insurance too, right? Yeah, so. it is. I think NCAA should be wearing visors, man. Um, but anyway, that's another conversation. But yeah, just a couple, couple things I wanted to bring up, and also congrats to Finland who won uh, gold, their first gold in hockey in the Olympics. So. Nice that's uh pretty cool and and Aggie talks about that uh uh in the interview with him which we'll get to shortly in Slovakia won bronze over Sweden so that was and they beat USA to get there which which was sick so uh 
Interesting. I don't know. I, I was kind of saying like the Olympics just, I think it's just because they were in China and the time difference was so much, but it, it's not as hyped also with no NHL players, but just Olympics in general, not just hockey. They, they weren't as hyped as normal, but I think it's because all the events are when we're all sleeping. Um, so it's just like tougher in North America to watch them and care about it as much. Yeah. Like it's, it's hard for, I don't know, say CBC or some broadcasting source to go, Oh yeah, we got like this huge event. It's at, uh, 4 30 a.m so everybody tune in get uh, get your deers out get your popcorn and watch like it's it's difficult when it's when it's like that and yeah i i know you you were saying that and it, it does make a lot of sense so we'll uh we'll see though canada always does a good job of supporting their um athletes though so i feel i feel like there was still a certain amount of hype just it's obviously very difficult when uh when the time time change is almost like flipped exactly you know yeah and uh, just last thing I want to say before we send it to the interview, but I want to shout out our former guest of the pod, Logan Thompson, who picked up his first NHL win last night against your San Jose Sharks. So he got the start and then got the win. So shout out LT, former guest and former Brock Badger. So that's always exciting. Um, yeah, and we'll send it over to the interview. Anything else you want to kind of touch on here before we go? No, I know I got a few things for the back end. So uh, let's hear from Maggie now. Okay. We are pleased to be joined by a friend of mine and Olympian now, Mikel Agard. Aggie, how's it going, bud? Good. Very good. It's uh, a little bit tired right now. Just got back uh, from a road trip last night. So um, a little tired, but uh, very nice to have a day off for once. Yeah, you've been you've been on the go. Do hey, you remember this sweater at all? This looks oh, cool. yeah, I do. <laughs> it's, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Great to see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like I mentioned, you just got back from the Olympics. So, I think everyone kind of wants to hear about that. So, um, do you want to talk about that whole experience? Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, like, um, first of all, like, a little bit disappointed when they uh, announced the roster and uh, I didn't find my name on there. Mm -hmm. um, so, from there, it was like, I guess I said, like, a little bit disappointing to begin with. Um, I was kind of like, tired of doing all like the information and get trying to get all these negative tests to uh, be able to travel to China. Um, so obviously I was like a little bit disappointed there, but um, had a good chat with the coach and he was, well, you just got to stay ready with everything going on in the world and stuff like that, that uh, we need, we might be able to, and to bring a couple extra guys. So um, I was, well, had a good chat with him. And as he said, that um, we were bringing a couple extra guys. And I went down to Copenhagen, flew down there, and we had a uh, one-day training camp, basically, where we were like five or six extra guys. And um, he made a cut where he decided to bring me as an extra guy uh, with like another forward and a defenseman as well. And then you, you managed to, you were going to be an extra, but you played every game. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, so basically what happened was that, uh, I got to travel with the team over there. Uh, didn't get a place in the Olympic village. Like once we arrived, uh, so that was obviously like, I wasn't really sure of what to really think because we were in a different hotel, like, like outside of like the bubble, but still within the bubble, like, because we could still practice with the team. But then coming there, we had we had seven guys test positive for COVID, mm -hmm. so which automatically meant like they couldn't practice the first two days because they had to get two tests right away since they tested positive in the airport. Um, so which gave me an opportunity for two practices and really show off, and uh, had two good practices and kind of just went with it. And uh, unfortunately for the two guys, they tested positive and had to stay in quarantine for 12 days. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you got your opportunity and obviously you got to play and, and that's unbelievable. But what about like off the ice? What was it like, uh, you know, being in the Olympics off the ice? What did you do? What were your, what did your days look like? I saw, you know, on your Snapchats and stuff, you were going to a bunch of other events and all that. So can you talk about that? Well, it was, uh, well, first of all, like after that, when, uh, I made when the code basically gave me the call that I was made, I made the team and I was going to play the first game. I moved into the Olympic village, uh, which is kind of nice that you live. We had an apartment, everyone had a single room, um, like a pretty big apartment. And then, 
Well, basically, there's a, a food hall that you can go down to whenever you want. You have to obviously wear a mask and stay, like, keep distance to everyone. Um, after that, like, well, we had a separate times. Like, guys were taking the bus at sometimes, depending on when you want to go to the rink for practice. And then uh, you just, yeah, practice, work out, come back, and uh, you basically have like a free day. Like if, if you want to go watch speed skating or any other like sort of things, you just coordinate with the GM for tickets and and you just jump on the, the shuttle bus and there you go. That's pretty cool, man. So yeah. I heard the food was bad. Is that true? Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I, to me, like for me, I can say that like, if you think about like an like an Asian or uh, Chinese chef trying to cook internationally, like that's <laughs> kind of like the the vibe I got there, and it was uh, it was definitely a lot of uh, pasta meat sauce that you just had to get through and fuel up. That's that's hilarious. And then kind of last one on this for now, and we may come back to it. But is there any like cool stories or moments, anything like that you want to share? Any cool people you met? Anything like that from the Olympics? Well, I'd say like, uh, well, we, uh, we lived like our building was right next to the Swedish building. So, uh, and they had like, um, as like now, and I, I live in Sweden, speak Swedish too. So you obviously, you know, I like, get along with them and kind of chat with them throughout like the, uh, the week I was, two weeks we were there. Um, but then when he got the gold medal and, um, set the new Olympic record, I forget what sport it was, uh, exactly, but just seeing like, how like all like the Swedish athletes like were celebrating and partying and like having just like great time, like celebrating that was just something very cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we're going to kind of fire it back to where it all started for you. And you you played minor hockey and even a little bit of pro in Denmark before uh, making your move over to the OHL. But did you always want to make it to the NHL kind of when you were growing up or was it maybe like stay overseas, stay in Europe and play there or was it always an NHL the dream? I could say, uh, like, well, obviously growing up, uh, I had a, a good dream of like making a, a professional team in my hometown. Uh, I was fortunate enough that like my, uh, watching my older brother play, uh, who's three and a half years older than me. So, uh, kind of felt like uh, going along with his footsteps, like, looking up to him and seeing him play for the professional team first, like uh, for me, it was pretty cool to see and definitely get me, got me the motivation to train and work hard, even harder to see what it took to get to that next level. Um, and then I felt like once I get, once I signed as a 15 year old with the uh, pro team, a three year deal, I was like, well, yeah, it was pretty cool and a great great feeling like playing in that league now, but um, I really wanted to test out and go somewhere else. When I was done high school, I was I thinking a lot my last year like, going over playing the CHL, I had a couple of buddies that was over there and re- enjoyed it. So I was like, why, why not? They like, give it a chance. It uh, could only get me closer to the NHL. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's kind of what I was going to ask next. So how did that like decision even come to be like did you did you just think okay I want to go my buddies are there did, do you have an agent who kind of guided you or how did how did it work in you ending up in Niagara well I had uh, obviously my agent he was uh in on that a lot too uh the last year before I um went over there we uh we chatting a lot back and forth like kind of figuring a good spot for me like within the CHL so uh before like the CHL import draft, I was talking to a team out in Seattle in the double and like the WHL uh, and uh, Saskatoon and WHL and then Niagara in the OHL. And I was I wasn't really sure which team was go to because all the three teams said like, well, if you're ready to come over, like we will take a chance on you. Nice. So you you came to Niagara ultimately, and obviously any of those three places you say like you're not gonna know being from Denmark what they're like and all that, but you come to Niagara and play for Marty Williamson, who now Iggy is Cardsy's coach right now in Barry, funny enough. Yeah. Um, so tell us about your time in Niagara. Uh, I was in Niagara at the same time as well, as you know. Um, so how, how do you find your first year there in Niagara, like on and off the ice? You, you did well, 41 points in 59 games. 
Well, yeah, it was uh, like a, a very great year, especially too that, uh, like, you know, coming over there it was first time moving away from home. Uh, so obviously that was a little bit challenging and thinking about that now you have to speak English all the time and starting to think everything in English as well. But uh, I was fortunate enough to move in with uh, a very nice billet family out in uh, Niagara Lake. And um, had yeah yeah like a great first year there in Niagara I was uh, obviously as I said like a little tough like getting used to like everything with like a new country playing on a like, new ice surface and um, just basic and getting used to everything it took a little bit of time for me and um, well Marty was great like from day one to get me into like all the new systems and how everything works within the league and stuff like that. So, uh, no, it was a, a great year for me. Also that year, you got to go to the World Juniors, represent Denmark, and you were the captain. Um, so tell us about that experience, captain of a World Junior team. Oh, it was uh, a, a really, really good experience. Like, uh, I think one of my best hockey moments uh, playing in that tournament, uh, coming in as like uh, an underdog, underdog and... Um, Obviously, our goal was just to stay in the best division. We uh, the year before we played in Poland and won, so we got uh, yeah got into the, the top division there. And basically, like I said, like we just tried taking it game by game and be fortunate enough to play very well. We had a really good team with uh, a lot of guys who played together for a while, uh, all growing up on uh, the national team. So. Uh, an unbelievable experience and uh, something I'm very, very glad to look back at. When, what year was that? So it was uh, the world, what was that? 2015, I think. Was it in Toronto? Yes. Okay. I remember that one. You guys, I, I actually, I was there. Um, your, it would have been your first, was it the first game you guys played Russia? Yeah, exactly. That game was unbelievable. Uh, it was crazy. We were up, uh, I think we were up two nothing, and then they came back, like scored right, like right last minute or something, and we lost in the shootout. I think. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that game. Yeah, that was there. That was crazy. And you guys were, yeah, you guys were crazy. And I was like, a bunch of us were cheering for you guys because we were like, ah, I don't want to cheer for the Russians. Let's go for the underdogs. So that, I, that's pretty sick. I didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't put two and two together that quickly, but. Um, Kind of going on from there, you go you go in your second year in the CHL and you split time between Niagara and Sudbury. So as an import, how, how did you kind of deal with getting traded? Was it uh, a shock or did you kind of see it coming? Well, I can say like we had a long chat uh, throughout the summer uh, with my agent and we were like, kind of like, I knew Niagara was trying to go for it. Um, and since I was an import and an overager, I was basically taking over two spots, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we had, I had a long chat with my agent during the summer and was like, well, do we look for a trade? Do I go back to Europe? Like, what do we really try and do here? And then he basically had a good chat with Marty and sounded like that they wanted to keep me there and were really happy about me and saw me as a part of like the team going for it um so i was obviously excited going back and felt like i had a good camp and everything but um and i also had like, like could tell that like i wasn't getting as much playing time as i wanted coming back as an overager and um yeah well i was kind of shocked when i first got the call like getting traded because i had a good feeling there but i knew that like they were trying to go for it so i figured that with having two the two other OJ overagers from Niagara, I was like, well, if they're gonna bring in another overager, I kind of knew that I, that would be me. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how did how did you like your time in Sudbury? And uh, like, there's mixed reviews. Sometimes some guys love it, some guys don't like it so much. For for you personally, how was it? Oh, it was great. I uh, I really really liked it. I got to a team that was struggling when I got there. And um, basically, like, took it day by day. Like, we, uh, I think we, I, I, as I remember, we had a very good group, a tight group, too. It was uh, a lot of fun, like, everything, like, both on the ice and off the ice. And um, just a great group. Unfortunately, we, we didn't make playoff that year, but um, still a great memory.
Yeah. And then from there you go on and sign your first AHL deal, sign with the Stockton Heat. And uh, you ended up splitting that season up and down the AHL and the coast. So uh, how was the adjustment to the AHL and how do you find your time playing in Stockton? Oh, it was good. I, uh, well, obviously it's, it's tough when you come in on an AHL contract. I didn't really know that when I first signed, mm-hmm. um, I didn't really have like, like the knowledge of all, knowing all that, but I uh, was really happy with my time in Stockton, but also as like a 21 year old for me, it was very important to play. I didn't want to just sit on the fourth line and play five, six minutes a night. Um, so we had a good communication there with the, the GM in Stockton and uh, with my agent as well. So it was good. That, and it was re- very good to get sent down to the East Coast too um, with only 10 forwards playing. Like you get a lot of playing time, which also helped me a lot when I got my chances in the American League because you were ready, you had played instead of just sitting on the bench, maybe being a health, healthy scratch and not really getting the opportunity. So uh, for me, it was a, a good choice to go down to the East Coast League and play and uh, develop there. Yeah, and, and you like tore it up in the East Coast and you were an ECHL All-Star in your first year, right? Yep. So how was the All-Star game in the ECHL? How was that experience? Oh, it was, uh, it was very fun too. We, um, we all had to uh, meet up at a tournament and had a banquet and basically just kind of like everyone telling stories like where they're from and stuff like that. A lot of team building there because we were playing a different, like actually playing against uh, one of the other uh, East Coast teams. So it was kind of fun to like get together with the guys and have to like kind of get to know them pretty quick because we're playing a game and stuff like that. So uh, that was a great experience as well. And the next year following, you played in Springfield with the Thunderbirds there. And how did you find that season go for you, kind of your second year pro, get your feet under you? How did you feel there? I think it was uh, a little bit like kind of the same. Like I, uh, I had a, a great camp. I come into camp, signed a one-way AHL deal with Springfield um it's kind of same thing there like florida signed a lot of guys so when they got sent down from florida camp like more and more guys just come in and it gets harder and harder to get a spot in the lineup um most and to be honest i was in and out the lineup it was tough to play there um we had a, a coach who was very determined on like if we lost a game like he would change up the lineups right away and if we won like you'd keep it the same um so for me like that was obviously like uh, a tough situation too because you basically knew like are we winning the game all right I'll play next game but are we losing well I might be out mm-hmm. so um tough experience there too but very happy I got to be a part of that Springfield team too like great team and um it was and same thing there like to uh, as like my first season like, I wasn't getting a lot of playing time so important for me to getting sent down and get some ice time. Yeah, no, for sure. And you say that with like a lot of ups and downs, how do you deal with that mentally? Like obviously you as a player, you believe you, you belong in the AHL. And when you do go down, how does that, uh, how do you handle that in your head and kind of stay positive? Well, to me, like, it's always, I, I always just been, I, I can, those kind of moments you just have to focus on yourself and be like, well, what can I do? Like, you can't really like control whatever, like the coaches and management and everyone else. You have to just control whatever yourself as a person, as a player can do. And um, basically with a lot of traveling that like, you get sent down back and forth and um, you just have to like, basically take it day by day and try and get better every day so that once you get the opportunity, when you're up, you can do the, get the best of it and hopefully like, earn yourself a spot. Yeah, that's that's great advice there, especially for all the young listeners uh, listening to today's episode. But um, we we sometimes get some funny stories um, out of the East Coast League. Guys have uh, funny memories to share and stuff like that. It's kind of putting you on the spot. But do you have anything that sticks out in particular from from your time in the either the ECHL or or the AHL that? Uh, was just kind of a funny moment or something like that? Uh, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, when I was in uh, Manchester, uh, the Monarchs in uh, New Hampshire, we, mm-hmm. uh, we had, I remember it was like a crazy uh, road schedule. 
where we played, I think it was like a Saturday and Sunday in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And then we, I think, it, no, sorry, it was a Friday, Saturday. That's how it was. So we played Friday, Saturday in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia at seven, both games. And then after that game on Saturday, we got pizzas on the bus. And then we bust home to um, yeah, back to Manch, which was like, I think, 14 or 15 hour bus. <laughs> So let's see, we left there at, what was it? We left there at like, yeah, let's say 11 or something. So we get back home. And I remember we had a Sunday game at home at three o'clock or something. So you're spending the whole night on the bus then you get back to the rink in Manch and you basically say, okay, like hang up your gear, you go home for an hour and then you come back and you have a Sunday afternoon game. <laughs> wow. It was uh, you get crazy traveling. Like a, uh, like looking back, like I'm like now thinking about like just like how crazy it was like getting on a sleeper bus and you know you're playing the next day at three. Yeah. And that's and crazy. pizza's on yeah. the bus too before a game. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Like you it's not really like taking care of what you eat, it's just you just have to get something in, right? <laughs> that's <laughs> unreal. So um, you know, from there you go on to, to U Sports, play for Guelph. And uh tell us about that kind of decision, obviously you're not giving up on your pro dreams, but you're deciding, you know, you have a school package that's expiring. And, and can you just talk about how that whole decision process went? Cause I know it wasn't an easy one for you. Yeah, no, it was uh, obviously very tough. I was uh, looking at like a couple of schools to go to. Um, but to me also, I was, uh, I was always like interested in school. Like growing up, I was very, very like good. And like trying to stay good in school. My parents were always like, you have school first and hockey. So uh, to me, like, it was very important to pick a school that I could transfer home in case I wanted to go home. And uh, I remember looking at Brock. I looked at... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I looked at a couple of schools. I looked at even out east. I looked at a couple of schools, 2PI and UNB. But uh, I remember, like, talking to a, um, a school uh, council at home that was saying that if you go to Guelph, you'd be able to turn all your classes home immediately. So if I went for a year or two years or whatever, I could bring everything home and get my degree from home. So that was always in the back of my mind. And uh, I'm very glad I picked Guelph. I had a great two year, two and a half years there. And it was, uh, yeah, a very special moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those who don't know, (laughs) I was also the captain of Guelph in your second year. So just a leader all all the way, but you lit it up in in your, in your uh was it your first year i can't remember you got the most goals in everyone in the country that year was it the first or second year well my like the first year i sat out so i switched to school in january so i had to sit out a full year yeah i remember. They only get to play was a four or five games that season and yeah. playoffs. so you played the one full season right yeah one full yeah yeah and that was the year you led the whole country in goals like you were just insane and we played you guys so many times and you were just oh it was brutal every time um and uh, you were on a really good team there. So how do you find life as a student there as well? Like, you know, going back to school again, how did you, how did you find that? Well, like, it was a little bit challenging, like, to begin with, too. <clears throat> Especially, like, I haven't, like, had been in school for a long time. So it was uh, obviously tough, like, especially, like, as English is my second language. Yeah. Now, like, every, everything with school is in English. Um, that was tough, but... Um, very glad that I had a couple of good teammates that got me into it and kind of got me all settled up with like class routines and schedules and all that stuff and getting me the help I needed, which uh, also we figured out, like went out to that I got a, a good results and good grades uh, all through the years. So um, like very, very fortunate to have good teammates. And that's the thing about U sports too. Like you go to class with your teammates and Everybody has kind of taken some, maybe some of the classes or friends that have so that they help you throughout everything. And it's a um, great experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now uh, I, I have to tell this story. And I, I was just, when I was writing this outline down for me and Cardi, this one just popped in my head, but do you remember the, uh, the frosty mug game? Uh, that's all the frosty mug game when you weren't playing. Uh, no, not really. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah. 
I'm not surprised. So let me tell this story. So this guy, for those who don't know, the Frosty Mug game is like the big game every year at Guelph. Like um, they play in the Sleeman Center where the Guelph Storm play. And, you know, they get like the whatever 4,500 fans packed. Agard has to sit out the year um, that year. And so he's not playing in the game. So, you know, he's there uh, as a scratch or whatever you want to call it, like ineligible. You know, a lot of drinks. I actually drove you to the LCBO before the game myself. Um, and uh, so he's very drunk. And that's why he doesn't remember. Now, I don't know how this happened, but you started like fighting fans, like your own fans, like, right? There was like 18 people around you, like fighting you on the glass at your own game. And eventually you ended up getting kicked out of the rink as a player on the team. Can you just tell us what happened? <laughs> well, obviously, like, uh, I don't really actually honestly remember much. I remember it was, it must have been something with, like, uh, a couple of guys, like, chirping and back and forth. Like, I, uh, to be honest, I uh, don't really remember much from that. I remember um, I was going down to – see you like I was sitting with you at one point and I know uh, I know you have a girlfriend now and stuff but there was a girl beside you and you introduced me and you said this is my wife <laughs> and she's like I just met this guy like 10 seconds ago <laughs> that's funny yeah no I actually wanted uh, probably a couple too many drinks in so uh, don't really remember that as much yeah sorry <laughs> to, to just throw you under the bus but that that's a funny memory of you that I, I had to share on here that's a, that's hilarious so that's good <laughs> Oh, that's unreal. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you weren't doing that in Europe when you went to the DEL. So you, you, you go there next and you're in a deal with uh, Grizzlies Wolfsburg, if I'm saying that right. And um, you got to play in the German league. So do you want to just kind of tell us what, what that was like? It seems like you're a pretty well-traveled player. I mean, you played in Canada, U.S., Denmark, now Germany. So at this point anyway, so going over to Germany how was that for you was it was it different or were you kind of just used to adapting to new countries well like uh well especially it was kind of like going quick there too because I uh I signed and there was like six minutes six or seven minutes left of the like the deadline in Europe so it was um I had to make a decision very quick um if I wanted to go or stay in like and play with Guelph in the playoffs um, but my agent back and forth, he was saying that this was a very good opportunity and I could, like, they, they were saying, like, you come back, come here, we need a player, we can, we'll can we sign you to next season if you perform. And I was looking to go pro and go back to Europe. So um, to me, it was like a known brain. I kind of had to give it a shot and go over there. And especially going from going to the DEL from U Sports, I was like, well, I can't turn this one down. So for me, it was a no-brainer and really just very excited to get over there. I got there and unfortunately only got to play two games because then the the season shut down with uh, COVID and everything. But uh, all in all, it was a, a little bit of an adjustment too because coming from Canada, playing like all like Canadian systems and stuff and then going over there, getting a German coach who's literally just playing the way he wanted to do. And um, it's a little bit different, but, you know, a good experience uh, overall. Yeah. And from there, you kind of found a new home in, uh, in Sweden with Modo, where you just signed a contract extension through to 2024. So first off, congratulations on that. And second, how, uh, how did, how did you find it in Sweden? I got to, I got to play in Sweden last year with, um, with the COVID pause, but playing there in the atmosphere and, the crazy fans um, compared to North America, they ramp it up a little bit. So how have you been like in Sweden? Oh, I love it. it uh, I think that now being, I've been in Sweden for a year and a half, I've uh, adapted and adjusted a lot to um, how the like, Swedes play and how like the Swedish leagues are. I am um, fortunate enough to play on a very good team right now. And last year was, uh, we were struggling a bit with like a bunch of different coaches getting fired and, so, but this season has been uh, nothing but great. Like it's, uh, it's crazy what an impact like the fans have uh, on the games too. Like when we play like the rivalry games, like we will have like around seven thousand, um, and they're just there, like coming before warm ups, like screaming, singing, having a great time, and they were there like when we get out after like getting dressed like after showering and everything after the game like they stay there the whole time and 
just want to scream, like just screaming and then very, very like passionate about the team. And it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and Raskin's normally the one who does all the, the homework and stuff. So are you guys in the Osvenskin or the SHL right now? We, we are in the uh, Osvenskin right now, but uh, right now we are in second place. And um, we've had a couple of good games against the team first. So uh, very excited to see what happens this playoff and uh, beyond, uh, beyond pumped for it to start. So that we uh, hopefully can, can win and get a chance to play in the SHL. Well, definitely, yeah, you signed a contract through for a few years, so that's obviously the goal to get up to the SHL, and I'm, I'm sure you guys will. I mean, that's a that's a team who is notorious over in Sweden. you kind of one of the well, more well-known teams, and you're up north there a little bit, so how's the sunlight been and all that? Is there well, much it's sunlight? Been, uh, uh, it's been this way. Like, during the winters, it's crazy, and... On the other side, in the summer, it's very, very much light. So it's uh, no, it's good, but uh, you kind of got to get used to it, um, especially when it's you know dark when you get to the rink, and then you get out of the rink and it's still dark. Uh, that's a couple of funny things, but um, right now, like it's pretty good. Like it's five o'clock outside now, and it's starting to get dark. So I guess it's mm-hmm. like now getting more like what you guys are used to back there. Yeah, start starting to turn. I, I know it's pretty rough in uh, December and January, the most I'd say. But uh, so, kind of just something that came to the team came to my head. Where do you live during the off seasons? Do you go back to Denmark or do you stay in Moto? Well, what uh, so how it works is like I'm on like a twelve months contract. So yeah, they want us to uh, like stay here and work out from May first till end of June, then we get July off. Okay. So uh, obviously, June uh, now it's been crazy with COVID in Denmark like last summer. So uh, I stayed up here um, and just trained with the, like the guys says from here. Um, this summer I will do a little bit of traveling and probably go home for a little bit, depending on like what the situation is out everywhere. But yeah, uh, fortunate enough that uh, you know I got my place here for twelve months out of the year, so it's a great apartment. Yeah, you can't complain too much. Kind of, it seems like kind of going through your career. This is the first time you've you've settled down a little bit um, and haven't been moving around. So that kind of brings me to something that just another thing popping up in my head. Um, how many how many countries have you played in? Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. So I uh, started off in Denmark, went to Canada, and then went to the States, and then Germany and Sweden. So this is a uh, fifth country. Wow. That's, and then that's that's Olympics in China, so you can throw that one in there. Yeah, Olympics in China, and, uh, another a world championship in Russia. Let's see what else? Like a couple of tournaments: in Belarus, Slovakia, France. It's yeah. been uh, it's been a lot of traveling, but I'm enjoying it. So it's uh, it's awesome. That's incredible. Yeah, it it's really cool the career you've had. Uh, we'll hop into some personality questions now. We got a couple. Uh, so Iggy, how would your teammates describe you? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I, uh, I would say, I guess, uh, a hardworking, uh, hardworking guy who's uh, always happy and um, trying to do his best every day. Okay, I like that. Um, how do you eat a cupcake? A uh, cupcake, I would uh, eat like uh, whatever, like the ice on top first, and then uh, yeah. get the rest. That's that's the <laughs> that's the right way to do it. Um, what do you like to do away from the rink? Well, I, uh, I enjoy uh, cooking now, and I always oh, yeah. have been doing. So uh, I enjoy, like, preparing a good meal. And, um, yeah. Actually, you good. know what? You're right. It's funny because a lot of the guys, like Cardi and I have on here, um, are always talking about how they struggle to cook. And when they're living on their okay. own playing pro, they don't know. But I remember it um, back when you were at Guelph and stuff. You would always send me your meals. You would always be having really good food. And you're a wine guy too. You're always having glasses of wine with yeah, you. Yeah, that's uh, that's a big thing too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you have a favorite wine? Well, I uh, enjoy a lot of uh, a lot of red red wine, and yeah. uh, a lot of like the from like I guess back when I was in uh, Ontario, I uh, I was drinking a lot of like the Wayne Gretzky. Yeah, the Gretzky. Yeah, Niagara Lake. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. right by your house. That's right near me exactly. where I am now. Um, yeah, love that. 
We'll uh, we'll take that into our new segment. We got this or that. So I'm gonna say two options. You just pick whatever one you prefer. So yeah. black black or white tape. White. Okay. Shoot first or pass first. Shoot first. Bar down or five hole. Mm, bar down. Uh, Canada or USA? Canada. Yeah. Um, hot coffee or cold coffee? Uh, say cold coffee. Candy or chocolate? Candy. Okay. okay. And not not a this or that question, but when I read the Canada US one, I was kind of curious about this. What's your favorite place to play out of all the five countries you've played in? Uh, I would probably say uh, Canada. Okay. Oh, so, we, no. nice. Yeah. Uh, and one more this or that. Let's go beer or wine. Say so, uh, wine for dinner, uh, beer at the bar. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go go over to, what was it, Um, Trappers and get yourself a yep. bottle of wine. Wine beer. <laughs> Imagine you're ordering, like everyone's at Trappers and you're sitting there with your bottle like, have, and your dinner. Um, that would be great. Oh, what a place Guelph is. Oh, yeah. God, I miss that place. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, I'm a Guelph student now, Iggy. Did you know that? I you were. I'm, I'm doing my master's online at Guelph. Okay. What, uh, like, in sports management? Uh, my MBA, so master's of business administration. Okay. Um, so well, I'm good for you. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm a Guelph, Guelph alumni student too. Yeah. They, they could use <laughs> me in the lineup, too. I don't know if you've seen. They, they play with three forward lines last game. Yeah, no, I saw that. I was talking to uh, one of my old roommates the other day, and he was saying, like, well, because of now a lot of guys left, right? Yeah, they've been having uh, some a lot of issues this year, players wise. I don't know if you saw. I don't. We don't need to talk about. It. I don't want to expose them, but they had a couple forfeit games earlier in the year oh, due really? to ineligible players and stuff, or something like that. Um, okay, I didn't even know that. Yeah, they're they're three of their four wins and the start of the season got turned into losses. Come on. Yeah, um, I guess actually, I mean, I might I could talk about it quickly, but they so they only had one goalie who wasn't injured or had COVID or whatever. So instead of playing two goalies and 18 skaters, they played their one goalie, the only one they had in 19 skaters, which is against the rules. So the, the three games they won with that, they ended up having to forfeit. Come on, okay, uh, really? But it's a good lesson for any future coaches out there can't play 19 skaters. Um, yeah, for sure. Anyway, a couple fan questions here, and we'll wrap it up. But uh, what stick do you use, and what are the specs on it? So I use a was it a Bauer Nexus? Uh, I think that's what it is. Bauer Nexus to uh, eight thousand. I think it's like custom, and then we got a. I got a special design on it. I got a uh, a little less than a P ninety two curb, and uh, with a little bit of higher blade on that. Like max height, but uh, a little bit higher. Okay. Right. Um, how do you like to spend your money? Well, I uh, I invest a lot, okay. and then um, obviously I like to treat myself as well. Yeah. What what yeah. kinds of things do you invest in? Well, like uh, I invest in a, a lot of like different stocks right now, and mm-hmm. then uh, me and my brothers. Uh, looking at a, a couple apartments and stuff that we are just kind of taking care of and renting out. Uh, that's nice. unreal, man. You should, you should get some student houses at Guelph and rent them to the hockey. Park. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that would be, a, I think that, that could be a very good thing too. Yeah. So uh, I'll have that in mind for sure. I, I've always wanted to do this cards. We should go 50, 50 on this. Like, Houses in Niagara here near Brock, they're they're cheap compared to in Toronto and stuff. And and everyone's moving in this area and in Guelph, like out of Toronto because it's so expensive. So the value is going up. And then you just put the hockey players, like I would just put our Brock hockey players in there. And you never have to worry about finding tenants because when one graduates, they just automatically put the recruit in there. And you just have just unlimited rent coming in every year and the value of your property goes up. It's a I just don't have the money, but if I did, it's a sure thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad idea at all. No. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Iggy. If you want to go in your Brock, I'll I'll give you the 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 hockey team. Yeah, you'll you'll take care of it. You just uh, get a ten percent cut. Yeah, I'll, I'll be your property <laughs> manager. Um. So it's funny you say the investing and stuff because uh, a partner of ours, the Gavin Hockey Well Specialist, who who we work with here on the podcast, there, um, they're money managers for NHL players, and they would love to hear that. Like that, that that's what they love. They they do investing for the players, like their taxes, you know, paying 
their credit cards if, if it comes to that point and um, making sure they're set up for life after hockey because you know you know you want to be able to live the rest of your life comfortably after playing pro hockey um, so the the Gavin group guys they're former hockey players themselves their staff have over a thousand games played in the NHL combined so they've been there they get it and uh, for you and for the listeners check them out gavingroup.ca they're the best in the business and uh, yeah they'll help they'll help you NHL players and OHL players, CHL listen to our podcast. They'll help you get your money right for the rest of your life and for you, Aggie, um, if, if you need. So, but it sounds like you got it pretty handled, like smart, smart guy. Actually, do you, do you have anyone who helps you or are you like into that stuff yourself? I know you said you uh, brought- Well, I, I enjoy doing it myself, but also my, uh, my dad has been an investment advisor for, for many years. So he's, uh, he's taught me a lot in this, uh, is keeping everything in charge so you know I'm not spending too much, which is I'm happy with too. Yeah. Are are you into NFTs at all? You know anything about that? Uh well not too much. I uh I've been trying to get a little bit more knowledge on that, but uh, yeah. I haven't bought anything yet, but uh definitely looking to do it soon. Yeah, they're they're pretty scary. Cardsy and I have been looking and talking a lot, and I actually I just lost a thousand bucks on one cards. Uh, okay. The Goonie one, I haven't sold it yet, so I technically didn't lose it, but it's down. Like all my yeah, offers sure. are really. Um, but yeah, so just be smart. Um, those things, those things are insane. You can't predict them. But anyway, we'll go one more uh, fan question here, and we kind of talked about it at the beginning, but people all just want to know like more about the Olympics. So like, what your life was, you know, at the Olympics, even about the hockey on the ice how was the level of hockey and all that stuff and and playing there well i'd say it was uh it's a very uh different kind of game it's um like because you put in like all the best players in the world beside the nhlers um and obviously it's a big stage everyone want to show off so the intensity is rocket high it's um it's tough it's it's a different game too, because when you take in all the European players who used to play on a bigger ice surface, and then you go to China and it's small ice surface, it uh, it, it makes it the game a lot different. But um, but I think it like for us and for all the other teams, it's it's about like playing the right way and playing smart. Um, if you see like a team like Finland, probably not nobody had, had thought they were gonna win, but they just played symbol and was lucky enough to score a couple of goals and that got them through the tournament. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's so cool. And now for the rest of your life, you can say you're an Olympian. Like it's, it's unbelievable, honestly. And, and, you know, I never would have thought that, you know, I just remember like watching you at Guelph and stuff, watching you in Niagara in the O and now, now you're an Olympian. It's, it's pretty sick. So um, that's pretty much all for me here. Cards, do you have anything you want to add at the end? No, I just want to say thanks a lot for coming on. It's pretty crazy to hear about the career you've had so far and looking to set yourself up for, for a while now and going to be continuing to watch you now. So all the best in the rest of your career. And, yeah, super, super nice to meet you and uh, hear about your career. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. I want to thank Mikel Agard for that great interview. And uh, good for me to get that, that stupid red Guelph sweater off and throw on the little badgies jacket here. So – um it was uh it was a good interview though he's a great guy it was really nice catching up with him we used to talk every day and stuff and and uh since he moved it's, it we haven't been able to talk so frequently um it, it was just nice catching up i know you talk about that too how it's always nice catching up with like using the podcast to catch up with your old teammates and stuff who you lose contact with so so that was a fun one for me yeah for sure it's always it's always nice to kind of catch up with the guys you kind of grow a close bond with and then things for whatever reason kind of you, you grow your own ways you, you you start going down a different path one moves to a different country and kind of things get lost in translation and next thing you know you're catching up and it's it's been a year so it, it, it is nice to uh to meet your buddy there Aggie. He, he's a beauty um, I know we were just talking about it off the air but it's really nice guy just kind of seems like a guy who's was energetic always just happy and kind of happy-go-lucky guy and it seems like it's working out for him he's had a successful career so far and I expect not in the last uh for the rest of his career as he's putting up great numbers this year in the Allsvenskan yeah he, he is lighting it up this year and earned himself that contract extension now um you did say you had a couple things for the back end so what do you have for us yeah no I just we'll touch on Jack Eichel um obviously 
a lot of anticipation kind of leading up to his return. So I don't know if you followed, but uh, you got anything on that? Um, I didn't watch the game, but I, I did hear about it and stuff. And obviously, I mean, if people do expect him to come in and kind of score three goals right away, like, you know, you got to understand too, and, and cards, you're going to know this and you're going to deal with this after your suspension. Um, there is a kind of a process when you miss, you know, like he was out 11 months when you miss that much time to kind of get back up to game speed. I know you're practicing at high speed and all that stuff, but it's not even just like getting your foot speed back. It's your decision-making speed, like thing you have to react so fast and especially at that level. So, you know, it's going to take a couple of games for him to adjust. And uh, I hope people don't expect like hat tricks every night until he gets going good, but Vegas is going to be nasty in the playoffs. And, you know, everyone knows they're kind of pulling a Tampa here, going to get Mark Stone back and, and be nasty. Yeah, for sure. Um, they looked good and they looked good last night against the Sharks and Eichel picked up two points. He gets him, I think, three points in three games now, but no, he looked good. Like he, he looks fast. Obviously, like you said, it takes, it's going to take some time to get back into like the, the swing of games. Like obviously there's different things that happen and you got to kind of go with the flow, but he looks fast. He looks well rested. He looks like a player is excited to be back out on the ice again. And I think Eichel, he's so fun to watch because he's the most, I, I think he's one of the most effortless, like best skaters in the NHL right now with those long strides he does. And he looks like he kind of just prances around the ice. So He's definitely an entertaining player to watch and one that we're going to keep our eye on here, especially with how Vegas is going to come down the stretch here and go into the playoffs as a wagon. And yeah, yeah. LT, he's uh, he's the backstopper for, for them. Yeah. I imagine LT gets a Stanley Cup ring like two years after leaving Brock. That'd be so sick. Um, It'd be incredible, yeah. But yeah, as far as Eichel goes, even you got to think he's playing with such a big weight off his shoulders now with the whole Buffalo stuff and he can just focus on hockey and that's going to make him such a better player. Not being, not having that kind of side noise the whole time and a fan base who loves him and has nothing against him now. And um, I think, I think Eichel is going to really perform, you know, from here on out for the rest of the season and in the playoffs. Like, um, so I'm, I'm excited for, for him and it should be interesting to watch Vegas down the stretch. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, what do you got here? Uh, I wanted to talk about Eichel. I'm trying to think about anything else. Uh, kind of drawn a blank, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a good episode. There's uh, no, my I do. I gotta get going to the rink for a little goalie session. I'm gonna start lighting up our goalies right now. We got an off day, but not for the tendies. So, um, time to show them uh, show them how to make a save. So, we'll see. We'll see how. You know, what's actually funny. Um, I'm warming up the goalies before practice a couple weeks ago or like last week. And I'm just doing like, you know, a shot to the, like, you know, move to the side, shot to the glove side, move to the side, shot to the blocker side. And, uh, one of the attendees just warned me. He's like, don't yet yeah, as a joke, like don't hit me in the face in, war- in the warming. I was like, no promises. Like I don't have as good a shot as these guys on the team do. And sure enough, I hit him in the face. <laughs> Man, that's actually funny you say that because I know we're going to get Goose on the podcast again eventually. So my goalie, he just signed um, with the Florida Panthers in Barry. But um, no, so he like he always says, like, I'm notorious for hitting guys in the head and like goalie skate. So, yeah, I'll always come down and we'll be doing it for like 30 minutes. It'll go perfectly. I haven't hit him. I haven't even came close. And then just one boom, boom, right off his head. And he's like, are you effing kidding me? Card just starts losing it. So it, <laughs> yeah. it's, Oh man, for for the young listeners again, I mean, some words of wisdom. This kind of whole podcast, but if you're still listening now, that's definitely a no no. Don't hit the goalie in the head and uh, warm up or or practice, or you're in trouble. Yeah. Um. Now I guess uh that's kind of all I got. You want to take it away with the the outro? Yeah. I mean, it's been a wonderful week. Um, family day obviously today. Hopefully everybody had a great time to connect with their family members. Um, get in touch and just be able to spend that time together and enjoy the long weekend. Um, but yeah, no, I, I know I have, I know you had a long weekend. You're just looking for some rest. So uh, with that being said, we'll kind of, we'll send it to next week and we'll look forward to seeing you guys then. <laughs>